you, everybody. This is beautiful. You should be very proud of this event and all the work that you've accomplished throughout the last year. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the three C's, and I bet you know what they are. Anybody? So many, so many C's out there. I thought somebody was going to say cool, calm, and collected, which of course they are not, because if you stick a fishing guide up in front of a bunch of river people or mountain people or lake people, they get very nervous. It is not cool, calm, and collected. But today I'm going to talk to you a bit about cold, clean, and connected. Right? Cold, clean, and connected are those three important things that our native wild trout, like our West Slope cutthroat trout and the bull trout, require in their home waters. Of course, the cold part is growing more important now than ever before as a river's warm. The clean part makes sense. Of course, no one wants to live in a dirty home, and we know that trout like to live in beautiful places. But the part that I want to focus on tonight is connected. As we try to protect native and wild trout, of course, the effort includes trying to connect with them, to understand them, the trout, to really feel what they need out of an ecosystem, what they bring to the ecosystem, and how their demise can actually change a healthy ecosystem. But for me, the most important strategy in protection is to connect with each of the humans, with each other. The humans involved in the effort to keep our waters cold, clean, and connected, and with the community members who are not involved in these efforts, who are not aware of the issues, and who may not know how to use their influence, their pocketbook, and their skills to help in every way they can and to do what you all in this room do every day. So the assumption would be that I focus solely on trout, but the truth is that I find myself deeply immersed in other fisheries because after three decades since the start of my guiding and professional fly fishery and angling career, I am fast friends with guides and anglers in vastly different waterways who are dealing with different but also eerily similar environmental challenges. For example, Tarpon guides in Florida's Everglades are working hard and have been recently successful in a legislative effort to restore the river of grass to its natural path after decades of trauma induced by an ecosystem altered by the massive sugar industry. In New England, guides attend meetings every month to keep a handle on the pogey issue. Of course, pogies are those menhaden bait fish that are the food for the prolific striped bass population and are grossly overfished for the dog food fish oil, and cosmetics industries. In the Pacific Northwest, steelhead guides have put entire seasons on hold in an effort to restore their wild steelhead numbers. In Louisiana, redfish captains this week are imploring lawmakers to enact a catch and release law for broodstock bull reds. Those bull reds are massive and actually not great eating, but they're killed kind of for bragging rights. And in Alaska, after decades of work, the EPA has finally listened to a tribal-led and fishing industry-driven campaign to stop the toxic pebble mine. Guides in Montana's Jefferson River Basin have launched the Save Wild Trout Coalition this week to fund the research and testing of diseased fish after a massive decline in fish populations that you've likely read about in the news this week. Now, I mention all of this non-flathead stuff and the non-flathead laker stuff because it is flathead laker stuff because we are all connected. And the remarkable thing is that all these folks in these dramatically different and variously challenged fisheries know about the flathead river system. They know about flathead lake. Some have worked here. Many have been here. And of course, all the others certainly want to come here. They know about our challenges and they have even heard about the successes of the flathead lakers. If they haven't heard about your accomplishments, they certainly are impacted by them, and they are connected to them. For instance, they are impacted and connected by the Flathead Lakers interstate connection that you made by helping ban phosphate laundry detergents nationwide in 2010 after first working to ban them in Flathead and Lake Counties in 1985 when I was just eight years old. Mm -hmm. And I actually remember seeing this on the news. Your connectivity went international in 2013 as you and your partners drove the North Fork Watershed Protection Act, for which I personally am grateful each time I guide our multi-day overnights from the border to Glacier Rim, feeling free from the threat of coal mine and coal bed methane proposals upstream in Canada. And, plot twist, 
you actually prevent connectivity too by striving to ensure that the trail of aquatic invasive species like zebra mussels is severed before reaching the flathead. Through AIS education, that signage, thank you Tom, that we see all the way from West Glacier down and inspections. Tonight, as we celebrate the Flathead Lakers 65th year, we do so on the land of the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people. The Confederated Salish, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes continue to lead in invasive lake trout suppression, dam management, noxious weeds mitigation, and AIS inspection in stations. And the Flathead Lakers continue to be closely connected to these tribes in support of their efforts and in celebration of their success. My pandemic project was making a film about the journey of one drop of water as it takes its route from the top of the continental divide to the Pacific Ocean. It's meant to demonstrate how the cascading ecological effects in nature reflect the cascading effects we the people have on our climate, climate action, protection of public lands, and of course, watersheds. Making that film was like an Alice in Wonderland trip for me. It taught me to look deeper in meaningful ways at my river-based livelihood, how we support our family, like being on the Middle Fork where, as Kate mentioned, those oil trains have a history of antiquated cars and derailments, and they're speeding by just at cast's length from my boat. And then the complexity of it all, because I always wave at those trains because I have such dear lifelong friends who are railroad conductors and engineers and technicians and such an important part of our economy. And I've always loved living near the trains, being able to hear the sound of those trains coming through our valley, bringing important economics from Chicago to Seattle. And knowing that the people who are working on those trains, friends I grew up with, are genuine river lovers and conservationists, expert anglers who are feeding their families and doing their best with the tools they've been given. So it's not the middle finger wave that I give them, but I wave and I know that we can work together. It's strange to float through my beloved town of Columbia Falls. Looking more closely now at the housing crisis as my friends on the city council and the city county planning board weigh whether a demand for housing warrants multiple large apartment complexes and condos along the river and adjacent wetlands and wildlife corridors. I want my kids to live here. We need a place to live. Again, such complex issues, we have to work together. And you, the Flathead Lakers, have been there through it all, offering your time, your scientific expertise, all the tools in your belt to help agencies and communities do right by the river, and I'm so grateful. It moves me because I know what you're doing. I see you, and it's not just me who sees you. The nation sees you. These anglers who care about the watersheds like you care about them, and are doing hard work the way you're doing them, they see you. I'm grateful and appreciate you. Finally, I do want to point out that my connectivity to you, um, and with our watershed, did not come by chance. For starters, I was led to appreciate wild places by my parents, were former National Park Service employees who taught me and my siblings to lead by example, as they did, that our physical and mental and emotional health is directly connected to that of the environment. They continue to teach this to their grandchildren. My dad, Dave Lang, was unable to be here tonight because he made the choice to go to the baseball game last night. It was really cold and we got really sick and was not able to be here. But, um, he, he taught me that we do need to listen to each other, and no matter what, political expediency should not get in the way of environmental responsibility. And we can work together, and also we are they. We can't always say, they did this, and they hurt our river this way, and they hurt our lake this way. We are they. We have that opportunity and that power to work here, live here, play here, and have a great time together and working here together. My connectivity with you tonight also um, comes from somebody who is unable to be here tonight, and that is my lifelong boss on the river, Ana Waringa, your board president. And he taught me that hard work can be fun. He taught me that hard work and putting your heart into it gives back to you, that your heart ends up getting full. 
that you end up getting your cup filled by all of the people who also care about watersheds in the same way that we do. And then also we don't pull up the ladder after we've succeeded. We keep it there so that other people can continue to grow and build and protect these watersheds the way we have. So it is by the grace of Anna and the grace of my dad, Dave Lane, that I accept this award tonight. Um, and I also want to say that it's funny because I, you know, I dedicate it to them because these are guys who have, in my life, been the biggest conservationists I could ever explain. And they don't get awards <laughs> because they're so humble. They work so hard behind the scenes every single day. So the two people in my life who are the greatest conservationists are the ones I dedicate this to tonight. So thank you for all being here and look for the conservationists and the river stewards and the lake stewards, stewards in your community who maybe aren't the ones who win the awards um, because they're quiet and they're doing the hard work. Work together with them and I am very, very grateful and eager to work together with you in the future. Thank you everybody.